And these can interact with each other and with the environment in very complex ways. And so understanding the evolution of these complex traits is a major question. And that's the big question that's driving the research in my lab. How is it that these complex traits evolve to give rise to all this incredible biodiversity that we see on Earth? And so that's what I'll be focusing on today. But towards the end, I'll also touch on this question that I'm very excited about as a future direction, which is whether once we understand these complex traits well enough, can we actually use that understanding to then go and introduce those complex traits into new species? Because that would have a, a wide range of really exciting applications. So the main challenge in this field is how to connect variation in genotype to phenotype. And the most widely used method to do this is QTL mapping. So I'll just give you a very quick intro for anyone who's not familiar with this. It's a nice method because it's very widely applicable. Pretty much any trait that differs between strains or species that you can uh, breed together can be investigated with QTL mapping. So the way that you do it is you start with your two parents that differ in the trait, you cross them to get an F1 hybrid, and then you cross those F1 hybrids to get the F2 generation, which will be diverse because it undergoes recombination. And typically you generate a few hundred of these F2s to have enough power to do QTL mapping. So then in each of these F2 individuals, you do genotyping across the whole genome as well as phenotyping for your trait of interest. And then you analyze these together to look for correlations that would tell you that a certain region of the genome is affecting your trait. And that is uh, represented in this QTL map. And you look for these peaks that tell you that a certain region is implicated. And this is uh, potentially very powerful because it can link genotype and phenotype. But in practice, there's also a big limitation of this, which is in most cases, these QTL peaks are quite large. So they tend to contain anywhere from dozens to hundreds of genes in each peak. And there are ways to narrow this down, but they're generally quite hard to do and they take uh, you know, many years of effort. And so people rarely actually undertake that effort. So most QTL studies just end up mapping the QTLs and then leave it at that. And so without knowing the genes or the pathways or the genetic variants involved in the trait, there's not a whole lot of biological insight that you can get. If you just know that a certain region of the genome affects your trait, it doesn't really tell you much about the biology of that trait. And so uh, that's why one of the major goals in my lab is to develop new and improved methods for connecting genotype and phenotype. And we think of it in terms of uh, this, these two axes, effort and the genomic resolution of the method. So QTL mapping would typically be somewhere up here. It takes several years or an entire PhD to do uh, a large QTL mapping study, and you generally have low resolution. So it's high effort and low resolution, but really ideally what we would want in a method is the opposite. We would like to have high resolution and hopefully low effort. And so that's what uh, we're working towards right now. So then once we've developed a new method, then of course we want to have the, the fun of applying it to lots of interesting phenotypes across the tree of life. And so uh, we try to, to apply them broadly to organisms ranging in size from tiny little prokaryotes all the way up to these cute but, but rather large and difficult to work with uh, zebra donkey hybrids called zonkeys. So I'll tell you uh, a little bit about the different organisms we've worked on in a few minutes. Uh, I'll just do a little bit more introduction to say that anytime we look between any two species, you can always find thousands of gene expression differences between them. And that's very easy to do nowadays with RNA sequencing. What's more difficult is interpreting what these tell us. So for instance, these differences can be genetic or environmental, especially in cases like humans where you can't actually uh, control the environment at all. That's a major factor. And then if they are genetic, the changes in gene expression can act through two different mechanisms called cis and trans. So cis would be a mutation that is linked to the gene that it regulates on the same chromosome. And this could be, for example, a promoter or an enhancer region. So it's only going to affect that copy that it's linked to. In contrast, transacting changes can be encoded anywhere in the genome. 
And this, for example, might be an amino acid change and a transcription factor, which can then go and regulate genes throughout the genome. So trans just involves some kind of diffusible intermediate. It doesn't have to be linked to the gene that it regulates. And I'll be using this terminology throughout the talk. All right, so we've seen through some work from my lab and as well as many other labs that cis regulation seems to be the major driver of phenotypic variation. And the best data we have on this is from humans. And we've seen uh, both in terms of human evolutionary adaptations, as well as human disease variants mapped from GWAS, that the vast majority of the signal in both of these cases comes from these non-coding or cis-regulatory regions. Only about 10% comes from protein coding regions in both cases. And so this suggests then that the cis-regulation is really the, the key to understanding the evolution of these complex traits. So given that central importance of cis-regulation, a key question is how can we identify cis-regulatory divergence systematically across the genome? Because that's going to be a very important first step if we're going to be able to study it. Systematically, we need to be able to understand which genes have undergone cis-regulatory divergence. And the, the solution that my lab uses for this is using hybrids to study what's called allele-specific expression. And this is a really powerful method, as I'll explain right now. So inside every cell in a hybrid, you can imagine you have two different genomes coexisting side by side, one from each parent. And so we can measure the expression level of each of those two alleles separately by using RNA sequencing and looking for reads that overlap heterozygous sites that let us assign the read to one copy or the other. And so if we do that and we see that the two copies have equal expression, we see that there's no allele specific expression. But if we see this case over here, where we have one copy, say the green copy is more highly expressed than the red copy, then we say that there is allele specific expression. And this, for example, could be due to a mutation in a promoter that downregulates this red copy only. It's not going to affect the green copy because it's not linked to that copy. And so uh, we can map out all of the ACE from the entire genome just by sequencing RNA from an F1 hybrid. And that what's really important here is this type of allelic bias can only result from cis-acting effects. It cannot result from trans-acting effects because a trans-acting effect would affect both alleles equally. Both alleles are present in the same nucleus of the same cells. They're exposed to the same transcription factors, the same chromatin factors. Everything is the same in terms of the diffusible trans factors. So any trans differences between the species will not be reflected in ACE. So ACE is purely a readout of cis-acting effects. And that's really important because looking at ACE then allows us to control for transacting effects, as well as many other potential confounders. Things like environmental differences uh, between, if you were to compare two different species, that might be an issue. Cell type abundances, which can also differ between species. Just random experimental variability and batch effects. Things that anytime you're comparing multiple samples, it's more difficult than comparing uh, the two alleles within the same sample. So this is a, a really nice method then for doing a very precise comparison of only the cis acting effects for all genes throughout the genome. And I should point out, this is not a new idea. Uh, this has actually been done since the 1960s. And what is new here is the way that we're using this for uh, being able to tell us about the genes underlying complex traits. And I'll explain how we're doing that uh, next. That was the introduction. And now I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been doing uh, with this approach. In the first part of the talk, I'll tell you about how we've been using hybrids to find the genes underlying complex traits. And I'll give you three brief stories where we've done this in flies, mice, and humans. And then in the second part, I'll tell you about how we've achieved even higher resolution of using genome editing to pinpoint the specific genetic variants underlying complex traits. All right, so the first a project is in fruit flies, and this was done by a postdoc in the lab, Peter Combs. And so we wanted to study reproductive isolation because this is, of course, a key step in speciation. Speciation species are defined by their reproductive isolation, and yet we have very few examples where we know the genetic basis of how that reproductive isolation has evolved. And so we wanted to see if we could investigate that using fruit flies as a model. 
And flies are great for this because we understand so much about uh, how they how they uh, mate with each other, each other and uh, what kind of signals they use. And so they use these hydrocarbon pheromones in their cuticles to differentiate between different species. And these pheromones are sex specific and they're made in enocyte cells. And so various studies over the years have actually mapped QTLs for these hydrocarbons between different species. And these give rise to some very strong QTLs but they haven't actually implicated specific genes in this divergence because these QTLs are quite large and no one's been able to narrow them down to the level of single genes. So we approached the problem with a specific hypothesis, which was that perhaps reproductive isolation could be caused by cis-regulatory divergence that's specific to the female enocytes. And in the species we were looking at, it was the, the females that show the greatest hydrocarbon divergence. So, uh, we wanted to test this, so we created F1 hybrids between two species of Drosophila called Simulans and Sachelia that have very different hydrocarbon profiles. And then we isolated two different cell types, the enocytes, as well as the adjacent cell type called the fat bodies, which we used as a control. And we did this for both male and female hybrids. So with all these different cell types, we performed RNA-seq and then did the allele-specific mapping in order to map out uh, ACE throughout the genome. And if we just look at ACE alone in this green circle, then we see there's a few hundred genes that have ACE, so it's not actually uh, that useful in terms of narrowing down to a small set of genes. But then if we look at the genes with ACE, they're specific to the female enocytes. Now we end up with only six genes, and that's a much more manageable number to follow up on. And so one of these was actually already known to be involved in fly speciation. So that was nice as a positive control. And then uh, three of them had uh, annotations that uh, were suggested they might be involved in uh, these hydrocarbons. And so uh, we tested these three by RNAi and we found that one of them called ELO-F had a really dramatic effect on the profile of cuti cuticular hydrocarbons when we knocked it down. And so that tells us that it has an important effect on the hydrocarbons, but we still didn't know if that might be involved in reproductive isolation. So to test that, we did a fly mating assay. And I like this experiment because it's so simple, but also so clear. So what we do is we just take a male and a female fly and put them together and watch what they do. And most of the time, if they're of the same species, they'll mate with each other. And if they're different species, they will not mate with each other. So for example, if we put together a, a male simulans with a female Sicilia, they will not mate. Likewise, male simulans with female melanogaster, they will not mate. But then if we just knock out this one gene, ELO-F, from Sicilia, now all of a sudden the simulans males are more than happy to mate with these females. And in fact, they do so at, at rates that are pretty much the same as wild type. Uh, within species wild type. And then if we look at melanogaster, we knock down our uh, ELOF with RNAi, again, we see a much higher rate of mating now between simulans and melanogaster. So it seems like this one gene, ELOF, is a really strong suppressor of interspecies mating because uh, we can induce the simulans males to mate with multiple different species just by knocking down or knocking out this one gene. So to conclude this first part, we found that cis-regulatory divergence of ELO-F seems to have contributed to reproductive isolation of multiple Drosophila species. And more generally, RNA-seq in a hybrid was a fast and efficient way to pinpoint a short list of candidates. All right, so now I'll turn to the second part, which is looking at hybrids of mice. And the question here is, why is it that some species heal wounds better than others? And this is work from a postdoc in the lab, Katja Mack, working together uh, with an MD PhD student uh, from the Longacre lab in the medical school here named Heather Dehardines Park. And this is brand new work um, that we haven't even submitted for publication yet. So one of the most dramatic phenotypes, in my opinion, uh, in all animals really, is this ability of some invertebrates to regenerate their entire bodies when you cut them in half. And they can uh, result in basically two clonal offspring if you just uh, slice one of these organisms. Now, if you were to try the same thing in a mammal, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you did, you would not end up with two 
uh, happy clones as a result, you would just end up with one very unhappy mammal. And so mammals have uh, apparently lost this ability to regenerate tissues. And not only that, mammals are not even good at, uh, at healing a simple wound like a cut. So in an amphibian, for example, like an axolotl, what you'll see is often perfect regeneration of a wound site with no scar tissue left behind whatsoever. Whereas in a mammal, you'll almost always see that you form a scar. And scars are not a great solution. They're weaker than skin. They also lack a lot of uh, the important uh, components, things like hair follicles and sweat glands. So it's just not a great solution. So why is it then that mammals are so bad at healing wounds? Well, it turns out uh, that's not universally true for all mammals. There's actually a couple of exceptions to that. So, and it was uh, a big surprise in the late 90s when it was discovered that there was a strain of lab mice called MRL, which is uh, pretty much a super healer strain. So here's an example where you can uh, make a small hole in the ears and a typical lab mouse will never close this hole. It's a permanent hole that they'll get, but an MRL mouse will heal it in uh, less than a month. And what you see here is that it heals it without any scar tissue. So you get regeneration of the cartilage, blood vessels, skin, and everything. And this is really incredible for a mammal. And it's not just these ear punches, there's other regions of the body as well that also show remarkable healing, but not every region. So an important exception to this is that if you have a uh, wound in the dorsal skin that is on the back of the mouse, then it will heal normally with a scar. So it's not a universal super healer. Now this phenotype was uh, very exciting. And so many labs have tried to map QTLs for it. And there've been eight studies published uh, since this discovery mapping dozens of QTLs uh, for this healing trait. And so even though uh, many QTLs have been mapped, none of these have actually led to the identification of any genes that are responsible for this because these, again, these QTLs are so large and it's so hard to narrow them down that nobody has been able to do that. So we really lack really any understanding of the genetic basis of how this, uh, this wound healing works. So again, we decided to approach this with a specific hypothesis, which is that perhaps these MRL ear uh, wound healing could be caused by cis regulatory divergence that induces a gene at the ear wounds where they have this, the healing abilities, but not at the dorsal wounds, which is where they're not very good at healing. And so to test this, we made a hybrid between these MRL mice and a regular healing strain of mice called Castaneous. Then uh, we waited for seven days after inducing these wounds and isolated cells from both the ear and the dorsal wound site. Then we isolated three different cell types using FACs, and these are different cell types that are known to be involved in wound healing, so we thought they were good candidates to look at. We then did RNA sequencing on each of these different three uh, classes of cells to see uh, whether we could find any good looking candidate genes. And the pattern we were looking for was very specific. So we were looking for a case where there was an MRL allele of a gene that was uh, either upregulated or perhaps downregulated specifically in the ear. So we would see higher expression from this in the ear wound, but not the same upregulation from the cast allele. And we shouldn't see that for either allele in the dorsal wound because we don't see the, the improved healing in the dorsal wound. So that would lead to a pattern like this where we see specific upregulation only from the MRL allele and only at the ear wound site. And we call this pattern differential allele specific expression or diff ACE. All right, so now here I'm just showing you uh, the data from one cell type, the fibroblasts, which were the most interesting. So we saw a number of genes that showed diff ACE in both directions. The blue points show you the ones that had stronger ACE in the ear wound on the x-axis here, and the yellow points show stronger diff ACE in the dorsal wound on the y-axis. So these blue ones are the ones we're especially interested in. And when we look to see what are the, the types of functions that are enriched in these genes colored blue here, then we see some very promising enrichments, things like abnormal response to injury and abnormal wound healing, and blood vessel physiology. So exactly what we would hope to see if this is enriching for genes that are involved in wound healing. Now, if we look at these genes that have deface, as well as this annotation of being involved in wound healing, 
then one gene in particular stood out to us as an especially strong candidate. And that was because it had stronger diphase than any other gene. And that was a gene called complement factor H or CFH. So if we look in the dorsal wound, the ratio between the CAS and MRL alleles was pretty much equal. It was uh, the equal expression from both. But if we look in the ear wound, now we see fourfold higher expression from the MRL allele as compared to the CAS allele. And this is exactly the pattern that we were hoping to see with the DeFace analysis. So this uh, was a good looking candidate gene. Now what does CFH do? Well, it's involved in uh, this complement pathway. So complement does a lot of things, including uh, at the site of a wound, it tends to induce inflammation, which is an immune response that will protect the wound from infection, but that comes at the expense of wound healing. So it tends to suppress wound healing in favor of inflammation. But now if CFH is there, it's an inhibitor of this pathway and can inhibit multiple steps. So what it does is it then shifts the balance from inflammation over to wound healing. And so we wanted to know whether this CFH protein was actually sufficient by itself to improve the wound healing in uh, one of these mice that doesn't have the ability to heal wounds very well. So what we did was we obtained some uh, purified recombinant CFH protein and uh, then applied that to the ear wound of the castaneous mice, which is just a regular non-healer strain of mice. And remarkably what happened was we see that the more CFH we add, then the smaller the scars get. So uh, if we have no CFH, you see a typical level of scarring, but the more we add, the thinner the scars get. And we can see a 50% reduction in the thickness of that scar. We don't know what happens yet when you go to higher concentrations That's something we're currently testing, but it's possible we might even be able to push this further. So in conclusion, uh, what we found was that this CFH gene can reduce scarring and its upregulation in the MRL fibroblasts might help explain the remarkable wound healing that we see in this MRL strain. And once again, we found that RNA-seq in a hybrid was a fast and efficient way to pinpoint a short list of candidate genes. All right, so now I'd like to turn to the third organism here in this list, which is humans. So, of course, hybridization is not always possible between any two species we'd like to study. And that's, uh, of course, true for humans. So as you're probably aware, humans cannot hybridize with any other species, including chimps, our closest living relatives. And while this is probably a good thing for human society that we can't hybridize, it's definitely not a good thing for my research program because it would be nice to be able to apply these hybrid methods to study human evolution. But we can't do that. Um, so we tried to come up with uh, a, another solution and that was involving uh, what's known as induced pluripotent stem cells or iPS cells. So it's been known for some time that you can take fibroblasts from a human and de-differentiate them into these stem cells. And you can do this not only for human, but also for chimpanzee. So once we have these human and chimpanzee iPS cells, we thought, well, if we can't hybridize humans and chimps, maybe we can just hybridize their iPS cells instead. And so we developed a protocol to do that by uh, coloring the two different species iPS cells with different colored dyes and then putting them together in the same dish and adding a chemical called PEG, which lets their membranes fuse. We can then sort out the cells that have both colors using facts, plate them out and grow up colonies, which we hope then would be hybrids. So doing the karyotyping on these cells, we found that they are indeed hybrids and in fact, they're tetraploids. So they have the full complement of both the human and the chimpanzee genome inside every cell. And so th this was very exciting because now we can apply these hybrid uh, methods that we've been using to study human evolution. But of course, these tetraploid cells uh, were uh, a bit concerning at first because we weren't sure whether they would uh, behave well. And in particular, we weren't sure whether they might just be sick or unstable somehow. So the first thing we did was to compare their gene expression to uh, the diploid parents. And remarkably, if you take the average of the two diploid parents, the human and chimp lines, and compare that to the expression we see in the tetraploid lines, we see an almost perfect correlation. 
And so this tells us that there is no major distortion, at least at the level of gene expression. If we look at the stability of these lines, we also see that uh, they tend to be karyotypically quite stable, about as stable as a regular iPS cell. And so this suggested to us that we could use these as a model of, uh, of human and chimp uh, hybridization to study uh, in vitro. So now there's a lot of things we can do with this. The very first thing we wanted to do was to decompose the cis and trans contributions to gene expression divergence between human and chimp. And so we can do this by uh, plotting this uh, human over chimp uh, expression ratio from the parental lines compared to the human chimp ratio within the hybrid. So that's the ACE. And so the ACE, remember, only reflects the cis contribution, whereas uh, the parental difference reflects all the possible contributors, including cis and trans, as well as non-genetic influences, things like random variability. And so we see when we do this decomposition that about half of the variation that we see between the species is explained in cis, and the other half is this trans plus non-genetic component. So we do see a rather different picture when we focus only on the cis regulatory divergence. Now, uh, we wanted to see what we could do with this, uh, this system in terms of differentiating, differentiating it into different cell types, because that's one of the best aspects of using iPS cells is you can differentiate them into a wide range of cell types that you might want to study. So uh, we carried out two different projects at first. Uh, one of them was uh, to look at brain organoids, to look at the evolution of brain size. That was work done by Rachel Goglia, and I won't have time to go into that today, uh, but it was uh, published earlier this year if you'd like to look it up. Uh, the other project was by David Gockman, a postdoc in the lab, who wanted to study the evolution of the human face. And so I'll tell you uh, more details about that now. So the question here was what genes or pathways have given rise to the uniquely human face? And although we know a lot about these, whatever genes and pathways contribute to craniofacial development in general, uh, when we started this project, we actually knew nothing about any specific genes or pathways that are involved in human-specific divergence of the face. So what we did was take these hybrid iPS cells and uh, differentiate them into what are called cranial neural crest cells, or CNCCs. And these cells are really important because they're the major cell type that gives rise to all of the bone and cartilage in the skull and the face. And so once we had these CNCCs, we performed RNA-seq and then looked for pathways that showed uh, a biased directionality in their uh, ACE patterns. And so when we look across uh, all pathways in uh, the CAG database, we found one in particular that showed the strongest signal of having this species-specific bias. And that was hedgehog signaling, which showed a strong pattern uh, favoring downregulation of the human genes in the uh, hybrid. And this was really interesting because hedgehog signaling is known to play an important role in craniofacial development. It just hadn't been linked to any human specific changes before. And so when we look at the, the genes involved in particular, we found that one stood out as having a larger fold change than any other gene. And that was a gene called EVC2. This showed a six fold lower expression in humans. And we were able to show that that is a human derived change because if we look at gorilla, which is an outgroup, it shows a pretty similar expression to chimp. So human is the outlier here with six fold lower expression, suggesting that a change happened on the human lineage. Now EVC2 uh, is an important player in the hedgehog signaling pathway. So it sits here at the base of the primary cilia and it sequestered this, this smoothened protein uh, until it gets a signal from patched to release it. And so uh, we had a few questions about EBC2. One was that, are the protein levels also lower in humans? We've been looking only at the mRNA level so far, but when we look at the protein level, we see a very similar pattern with RNA uh, here in orange and protein levels here in green. So chimp looks higher than human in both cases. So that was good to see. The second question was whether the six-fold downregulation of EBC2 actually affects hedgehog signaling because you might imagine maybe the pathway is just so robust to levels of EBC2 that a six-fold change doesn't have any impact on the output. And so to do this, uh, we came up with two different ways 
to modulate the levels of EPC2 and then measure the hedgehog signaling output as a result. Uh, one of these was using a doxycycline inducible promoter, and the other one was by introducing different copy numbers of an EBC2 construct into cells that uh, were, lacked the EBC2 gene. And in both cases, we found a similar result, which is that a, a six-fold change in EBC2 is actually more than enough to result in a large change in the output of this pathway. So it seems that uh, mammalian cells are not robust enough to tolerate a six-fold change in the levels of ABC2 without changing the output of this pathway. So the six-fold change is likely to be important. Finally, we wanted to know what could be the phenotypic effects of EBC2 downregulation. And so to look at this, we started by looking at a mouse where we could knock out EBC2 specifically in the, these cranial neural crest cells. And the most dramatic phenotype we saw uh, comparing the wild type mice to these knockouts here on the right was that the knockout mice have much flatter faces. And that is really exciting because it's actually in parallel to what we see in humans, where humans also have much flatter faces compared to chimps. Um, and that the directionality is consistent here with the, the knockout mice having less EBC2, uh, as well as humans having less EBC2. So uh, when we looked at more phenotypes, it turns out it's not only the flattening of the face, uh, there's actually many other phenotypes that differ between the wild type and knockout mice as well. And when we look at these and compare them to differences between human and chimp, we find that in 14 out of the 16 cases, these phenotypes actually go in the same direction as the human chimp differences. So for example, these knockout mice have thinner hair and so do humans compared to chimps. These knockout mice have smaller teeth and so do humans compared to chimps. And this this uh, directionality agreement suggests that perhaps EVC2 might be able to help explain not only the flattening of the face, but many other human specific phenotypes as well. Now, of course, mice are not perfect models for humans. Uh, so we want to know what happens if a human ha loses EPC2 function. And we could actually answer this question because in the medical literature, there's a syndrome that's been known for some time. It's extremely rare, um, but it, it occurs uh, in a handful of people where they lose the EVC2 function completely. And uh, that results in what's called Ellis van Creveld syndrome. And so comparing the known phenotypes that have been documented for these patients compared to healthy humans, we found uh, a list of 25 of them that we could also compare between human and chimp. And 23 out of these 25 showed, once again, the same directionality in uh, differences between human and chimp, where in these 23 cases, the direction of the EVC the, the Ellis van Creveld patient compared to healthy humans was the same as the direction of change of healthy humans compared to chimps. So we think of this like a continuum of EVC2 activity where chimps have the highest, healthy humans are intermediate, and then Ellis van Creveld patients are the lowest. And this is uh, interesting because it parallels not only this uh, protrusion of the face, but also uh, other phenotypes that I haven't uh, had time to mention, things like the length of the digits, which also uh, differ in Ellis van Creveld patients and show this spectrum that correlates with the EV EVC2 activity levels. So we think this is really exciting because it seems that the disease mechanism of Ellis van Creveld syndrome, which is loss of EVC2, uh, is just basically an exaggeration of uh, what's already been happening in human evolution for the past few million years, which is lowering the levels of EBC2 activity. So the disease mechanism seems to parallel the evolutionary mechanism. So to conclude uh, this part of the talk, we think that these human chimp hybrid IPS cells are a really exciting system for studying human evolution and letting us measure human cis-regulatory divergence for the first time. We uh, studied them in terms of brain organoids, which I didn't have time to tell you about, uh, as well as the, these, uh, these cranial neural crest cells, which implicated EVC2 and hedgehog signaling in the evolution of the human face. So looking at all three of these examples put together, as well as others that I haven't had time to tell you about, what we've learned is that allele-specific expression can be a very powerful approach for studying these genes underlying uh, complex traits, but it's not enough by itself. So you need to intersect it with other aspects, things like tissue and condition specificity, uh, like we did with the flies or knockout and pathway information. Um, and at the center of these intersections is where we see 
that we can get a small number of candidate genes, which we can then follow up on and, uh, and actually test whether they're actually involved in the phenotype of interest. And so we think this is a really uh, powerful method because it can be applied broadly to any time you can measure a little specific expression um, and uh, is quite a bit easier and uh, more high resolution than other methods like QTL mapping. All right, so that's the first part of the talk. Now in the last few minutes, I'll turn to this other approach we've been taking, which is using genome editing to get even higher resolution down to the level of single genetic variants. And this has a, been a large team project in the lab um, with many folks working on it over the past five years. So the general idea here is that uh, we could use genome editing to achieve single variant resolution by starting with a, a single reference genome, and then we have a list of variants that we want to test. These, for example, could be genetic variants that differ from the reference genome uh, in a strain or species that differs in some trait that we care about. So we know that one of these variants gives rise to that one or more of these variants gives rise to this trait, uh, but we don't know which one. So we don't want to test all of them individually. And so we could do that then if we could engineer this reference genome to have one variant different at a time. So if, if only one variant is different in the entire genome, then we can measure the phenotype that we care about and look for a case where that phenotype differs from the reference phenotype. And if that variant, if that phenotype differs, then we know that whichever, um, whichever variant we engineered into that strain that differs must be responsible for that difference because we are only engineering one variant at a time. So that's the goal here. Now, this is a challenge because uh, although precision genome editing is uh, widely used now with the CRISPR system, it's still uh, rather low throughput in most applications. So the way this works uh, is if you want to edit a single genetic variant, then it's a two-step process. The first step is you uh, cut the genome and create a double-strand break with Cas9. And the second step is that you introduce a donor DNA molecule, which has your mutation of interest with some flanking homology. And the hope is that when the cell is repairing this double strand break, it will use this donor DNA uh, to do that repair. And while it's repairing, it will then incorporate this mutation from the donor DNA into the genome. So this first step of cutting is very efficient, uh, but the second step is rather inefficient. And so it's the second step that's really the bottleneck here. So the reason for that is just because when you have a double strand break in a genome and you introduce a donor DNA, it's not that likely that the donor DNA will happen to find this double strand break and get incorporated. It's just a, a, a kind of a rare occurrence. And so what that means in practice is that if you want to create a precise edit using Cas9, then you have to screen through many organisms or many cells to get the one you want. So usually uh, the, the more common outcome of this is either no edit or just random mutations caused by a different uh, repair pathway called non-homologous end joint. So uh, that's the issue that is preventing us from doing, from screening through thousands of these, because if you want to screen through thousands of mutations, you really uh, can't can't scale up this type of uh, inefficient process. So we needed to improve the efficiency of genome editing in order to make it high throughput. And so the way that we did this was by actually tethering the, the donor DNA to the guide RNA with uh, creating this hybrid DNA RNA molecule, which uh, then brings this uh, donor DNA to the cut site because the, the guide RNA comes with Cas9 to the cut site. And if it's dragging this donor DNA with it, then the concentration of the donor DNA at that cut site will be much higher than it would be otherwise. And so we're, it's our hope then that this would result in more efficient editing at that second step. Now, the way that we do this tethering is by taking advantage of a naturally occurring element in bacteria called a retron. So uh, you may know that Cas9 is a protein from bacteria involved in antiphage defense. And similarly, the retron is another genetic element from bacteria also involved in antiphage defense. And what the retron does is it has a reverse transcriptase that uh, recognizes an, a particular RNA template and it does reverse transcription to create this single strand of DNA molecule. And what's really unique about this is that 
it creates a covalent link between that single strand of DNA and the RNA molecule that it's uh, transcribing from. And so that means that you end up with this hybrid molecule that's part DNA and part RNA. And so if we take the guide RNA and just add this extension to it, which has this uh, retron scaffold, as well as the, the donor template with the mutation of interest that we want to introduce, then we can just express this RT in whatever cells we want to edit. And uh, then it'll go ahead and do the reverse transcription, creating this single strand DNA coming off of this guide RNA uh, molecule. And so this will then hopefully increase the efficiency of editing. And so we have a, a cute acronym for this. Uh, we call it CRISPY, which stands for Cas9 Retron Precise Parallel Editing via Homology. All right, so testing CRISPY in yeast, we found that if we don't express the RT, so we're just doing editing off of a plasmid, then you see very low rates of editing. Just a few percent of cells get the correct edit. But once we express the RT, now we see editing going up to nearly 100% efficiency. So this uh, is really exciting because it allows us then to scale up editing into something that's very high throughput because we no longer have to test each cell to see whether it got the edit. Once you're at uh, essentially 100% efficiency, you can just assume that the cell got the correct edit if it got the construct. And so we can then ask whether we can identify natural genetic variants affecting a complex trait using this system. So the uh, initial test case we used was comparing two different strains of yeast called BY, which is a lab strain, and RM, which is a, a wild isolate from a vineyard. And their genomes have been sequenced already, so we know the list of all the genetic uh, uh, differences between them. And so we can just use BY as our reference strain and use CRISPY to introduce these RM variants one by one into the BY background. So we end up with a, with a collection of strains, each of which is completely the same as BY, except for just one position in the genome, which has the RM variant. And in our initial screen, we did this for uh, 16,000 variants using 32,000 guide donor pairs. So then once we have uh, these edited strains, we can measure their fitness, which is simply growth rate for yeast. And uh, that's, I'm showing you some data here where the lines in black show you the wild type fitness. So they don't change over uh, about 25 generations uh, for which we ran this competition. But if you introduce a variant that increases fitness, uh, that's shown it with six replicates of the same variant in red here, then you see that that uh, abundance of that strain increases. Whereas if you introduce a deleterious variant as shown by six replicates of the same variant in blue, you see that that uh, strain decreases in fitness. And so we were able to use the system to measure the fitness uh, for thousands of these different variants, and we're actually able to map a few hundred that affected fitness in yeast. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to go through all of these results, um, so I'll just uh, tell you what we're currently doing. Um, we're working in many ways to improve the system uh, in uh, different technical aspects like the barcoding. Uh, we're working on different applications in yeast, so things like uh, genetic interactions that involve uh, uh, epistasis, as well as in gene by environment interactions, and then optimizing CRISPR for use in other species. So for example, uh, we have this uh, preprint on BioArchive that shows that uh, we can actually use the system in human cells as well, although it's not as efficient as it is in yeast quite yet. Uh, and if you're interested in looking up uh, more details of this, um, of this system in yeast, uh, that work uh, has been published, so I won't uh, spend too much time on that today. Instead, I just want to wrap up by going back to this question I introduced in the beginning about how we can perhaps use this uh, system to go from understanding to engineering. And so the question here is whether we can understand these complex traits well enough to introduce them into new species. And our goal here, here is really twofold. The first one is uh, summarized by this quotation from Richard Feynman, who said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So if we can introduce a complex trait from one species into another, then we can be pretty sure that we understand its genetic basis quite well. So it's a test of our understanding. But I think even more important than that is the potential range of, of practical applications that we could use here. So uh, in fields ranging from agriculture to medicine to bioengineering, if we could introduce complex traits into new species, then there's almost no end to what we could do with such a powerful tool like that. And I think of it in a three-step process. So the first step 
uh, would be uh, get, getting from the level of uh, the whole genome down to candidate causal genes. And I hope I've convinced you that hybrids are a good system for that. The second step would be going from those candidate genes down to individual genetic variants. And we could test thousands of variants in those causal, uh, those candidate genes using the CRISPR system that I just told you about. And the third step would just be once we have that list of, can of causal genetic variants, transferring them into a new species. And once again, this could be done with CRISPR because all it requires is a highly efficient system of precision genome editing, which is exactly what CRISPR is. So it's our hope that we can use these tools put together in order to uh, hopefully transfer complex traits from one species to another. And so that's something that uh, we're hoping to apply to a wide range of traits and species. All right, so with that, I just want to end and say uh, thank you to all the members of the lab. This is everyone who's ever been in the lab. I don't actually have a lab of this many people, but uh, this is just everyone who's ever been in the lab. Uh, and I want to say thank you to them. They're a, a great group of people. And uh, without them, none of this would have been possible. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And I'd be very happy to take any questions you have.